Tonight, we are here to welcome and listen to Ms. Bethany Collins. Um, I had the pleasure of actually working with her some years ago, and she trusted me via the phone and multiple emails to, to do good things and put her piece in a show. Um, and so it's really my pleasure to finally have her in person and related to a pro doing a program in relation to an exhibition um, that I have co-curated. So enough about me, more about Bethany. Bethany is a multidisciplinary artist whose conceptually driven work is fueled by critical by a critical exploration of how race and language interact. She lives and works in Chicago, Illinois. She also lives and works between Atlanta, right? Um, she received an MFA from George State Uni Georgia State University um, in Atlanta, Georgia, a BFA from the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and attended the Glasgow School of Art, uh, Capstone International in Glasgow, Scotland. Her works have been exhibited in solo and group exhibitions nationwide, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Drawing Center, the High Museum of Art, and the Birmingham Museum of Art. She, her work is included in public collections of the Birmingham Museum of Art, the High Museum, the Montgomery Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Zuckerman Museum at Kennesaw State University, uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and the Agnes Scott College, among many others. Um, Bethany has had numerous uh, residencies and fellowships. Um, and in 2015, she was awarded the Hudgens Prize, and she is continuing to rack up many awards. Um, and before I invite her to come up here, I really just want to read a little bit of um, her artist statement, because I think she says some very important things that I want to touch on them herself. Um, but she says, I'm interested in the unnerving possibility of multiple meanings, dual perceptions, and limit limitlessness in the seemingly binary. Drawing repeatedly allows me to understand objects in space while defining and redefining my own racial landscape. For me, racial identity has never, neither been instantly formed nor conjured in isolation. Um, and then I'm skipping down some. It says, from my earlier white noise uh, works, like white noise to more recent works, each new body of work borders on an obsessive preoccupation with language, its ability and inability to negotiate a way of being in the world. But I have found in my practice a delight in these obsessive preoccupations. And in the solutions, they slowly, ever so slowly, but inevitably offer. So. Please welcome Miss Bethany Collins. Thank you. I'm getting over a cold, so let me know if I start mumbling. I'll start like speaking into my own mouth. Can you hear me okay? So I'm Bethany Collins. Thanks for being here this evening. Um, I thought I'd work you through, take you through some works. Could we turn the lights a little bit down? Um, all of my work grapples with ideas of race, um, identity, language, history. In particular, the language is the, the thread that connects all bodies of work. And I think about language as the subject. It is the material out of which I'm often making, from old dictionaries and encyclopedias and literary journals and archives of outdated newspapers. It's the medium. But it is also, I found, a kind of prism through which I can interrogate any other topic. And I think in this early body of work to the work that I'll show you at the very end of the, the uh, evening, the reason for my uh, attention to language has shifted. But I think it's something similar to what uh, Tanahisi Coates wrote about in his dispatches from France. That he was writing, I think he received some fantastic big award a couple of years ago. This is before the MacArthur Award. And he used that money to move his entire family to Paris to study the French language, to immerse himself in the French culture. And so while his family is out kind of gallivanting around the city, every day, nine to five, he's in class learning French. And he sends back these, what he calls, dispatches from France to be published in the Atlantic. So in this one particular dispatch titled, or perhaps you are too stupid to learn French, 
He says that he understands why people see a place, a different place, without knowing the language. If we waited on fluency, most of us would never see anything new. But knowing the language makes a place four-dimensional. There is something about struggling with the language and learning the language that only then does the place become fully realized in your mind and in your body. And that struggle with the language is something that still, um, I'm still grappling with in different ways. So this is my earliest language-based work. I was um, a black grad, I am a black grad, I was, wait, that's not the way to say this. I was the only black grad student at the time. I'm originally from Alabama, and I did my MFA at Georgia State University. So most of my um, peers were white, and I was making work about race, and it was leading to these very awkward conversations. And so I started to take those conversations and make that the work. For instance, I made a paper bag piece that was about colorism within the black community. It was a paper bag printed on butcher paper, so it was very didactic. Um, it was as direct of a work as you could possibly make. And the critique I got was, well, don't you think your work is a little elitist because I don't know that history? I don't see race, so I don't know how to critique your work. I don't see color, so I don't know how to speak about your work. Maybe if you made that paper bag into a slave ship, then I would get that it was about race. These are like bad ideas. They're really awkward conversations to have in a very like vulnerable setting um, in that early grad school kind of um, space. And so in order not to make a thousand little slave ships, it's not the work that I wanted to make. I didn't want to um, internalize those ideas that were being spoken in that setting, I started to write that language over and over in this across the chalkboard. So this piece is, do people ever think you're white? And so behind, I don't know if you guys know what, did you guys have chalkboards when you were in school? Were they all whiteboards? Like those magic whiteboards that are digital now? They don't retain the same kind of residue that the chalkboard does. But it used to be that you would write uh, some kind of lesson across the chalkboard a hundred times until you like learned the lesson. It feels like it's physically knowable um, after a hundred times of writing it. And then I would erase that language, the same language as the title here. And then I would write that same language of the title, but break it apart into these tiny letters. So what you're seeing is these like clusters. You know, sometimes they look like stars, sometimes they look like land masses, they're geographic. It's hard to discern what they are, but the process of making them is me obsessing on that language. Do people ever think you're white? Do people ever think you're white? Over and over again, and writing it a thousand times. And then by the end of it, this is unrelated, so the same sort of process here. By the end of it, it feels like what started as a problem in the language, I've made something more lovely out of that. And I've also obsessed on it to so that I'm not really a good first responder. But the first time you say something to me, I'll have a better response the second time. But writing it and obsessing on it a hundred times, by the end of that process, I feel like, oh, that's what I wanted to say, back to that question. I feel like I understand the intent of the speaker and what my response should have been. But eventually, instead of letting that language go, right, writing it a hundred times, dealing with it, grappling with it, you should be done by the end of that process, I felt like I was just getting tighter and tighter. And so I needed a new way to uh, expel that language from my, from my studio and from myself. And so I would take, I would, kind of a similar process here, this is a photograph of chalk dust. So I would write the language, in this case it was I wish I was black too, so the same kind of critique setting. Write that language over and over again, um, erase it with those old school felt erasers, and then clap those erasers together and let the dust kind of cloud out of it and photograph that dust. That then was like, the intent of it was to let this thing go. I think though, it's like ironic, it's permanently captured forever. Now it's a photograph, right? It's never gone. But this idea of the residue of language is something that, so that's a little bit of older work. This residue of language is something that I'm still interested in. Um, and I wanted to find a different way to think about it that wasn't so direct. I think those white noise chalkboards and the photographs, the thread of that is continued, like that obsessiveness, the idea that language is never gone, it always resides somewhere in the body, that you don't really understand a thing until you make it physically manifest. All of those ideas continue throughout my current work. But the way that I wanted, I think the language that I was looking for was more spacious. 
I started to look through old dictionaries looking at color terms. And I noticed that in 1984, the definition for gray, the color gray, changes in the American Heritage Dictionary. So in the 70s, this term, designating an urban area, deteriorating into a slum, that's not there. And by the 90s, it's gone again. It's only there in the 80s dictionary. So then I'm thinking, oh, well, this text that I thought was right, it's supposed to be this official, unbiased um, right, two tome of uh, who we are. It's kind of like, if you know all the words in a dictionary for a particular language, then what can you not know about us, right? It's a kind of reflection of who we are at any given moment. So in the 80s, it's interesting that gray takes on this terminology, and it's not there the decade before, and it's gone again the decade after. And so what does that say about what we're grappling with, in particular, that decade of the 80s? That didn't last very long, though, because then I stumbled on contronyms. So contronyms are words that contain their own opposite meanings. There's about 88 in English. Quiddity is still my favorite contronym. So quiddity is the essence of something and a trifling nothing. It is everything and it is nothing at the same time. And that felt like a more spacious way to be thinking about identity. It is everything and it is nothing simultaneously. Ravel is also a good contronym. It means to tangle it all up, kind of like Christmas lights, and it's all in a jumble. And it also means to simplify it and draw it out in a straight, linear kind of composition. It is complicated, and it is simple, raffle. And those oppositional terms then are embodied in the same, term, in the same word. This is flesh from 1982. So the text that's left legible then in this diptych are those opposing definitions. So flesh, one of the definitions is mankind in general, humanity, one's family, one's kin. It is everybody, and it's just the people that I like. Right? But this comes from the same term, same year, same definition, same book. They're always printed as diptychs so that the op those opposing definitions have to abide one another forever. And maybe that's intention, or maybe that's a kind of peaceful uh, resting place beside one another. They're printed, so the process for these works is that I'm taking diff definitions from usually American Heritage Dictionary, sometimes Webster's New World. American Heritage tends to be more poetic. Maya Angelou was actually on the Contributors Board in 1982, and I think it was like all her. <laughs> <coughs> Carl Sagan, I think, was on the Contributors Board that year. It's actually a very controversial dictionary. Because they, like, if a dictionary can be controversial, that was it. It exploded. And people hated it because they weren't official kind of linguists who were deciding how things should be defined. They were just regular, everyday people and poets um, and scientists. I think Scalia, uh, the former justice, was on the board that year. I'm sure his, never mind, I won't say that. Um, but actually, that decade, the illustrative sentences become particularly violent. This is an aside from this work, but I think it's interesting. In 1982, if you take the word find, F-I-N-D, um, the illustrative sentences that like, give the definition context are the burglar will be found out, the liar will face justice, the jury will find for the defendant. Like, you could say anything to give context to that word. I found a donut and I was happy. Instead, they're all about the justice system, a kind of morality, a kind of vengeance. And there's something interesting that, that happens in the 80s. It happens the first year that you have people who are non-linguist, just everyday people, giving context to the terms that we use. And also that it's in the American Heritage Dictionary. It's not Webster's New World. It's not any of the Oxford OED, those texts. American. It's interesting. Um, oh, sorry, so the process. Photo transfer of those definitions onto American Masters bright white paper. Photo transfer is just like it's the most simple printmaking process you can do. You rub that text onto the surface of the paper, and then I always rewrite the text in graphite so it feels like I am physically writing the text rather than just copying it. It becomes mine, kind of ownership. And then this illegibility is actually comes from me using spit and those old school pink pearl erasers and erasing, it actually kind of eats into the top surface of the page. So that legibility is actually because the paper is deteriorating bit by bit. 
<coughs> and of course, what's left legible is those opposing definitions. This is quiddity from 65, so the essence of a thing, a trifling nothing. This is protest, 1953, to state positively, to assert, to speak strongly against. Same term. <laughs> I think what I loved about these, and I still love actually, is the kind of poetry that comes across. Versus the white noise felt like a way to grapple with a problem language. There is no solution here. There just has to be a kind of abiding, um, abiding in opposition forever. <laughs> this is dust from 1970. So to bathe in dust, set of a bird. To rid of dust as by brushing, shaking, or wiping off. <clears throat> Not every contronym is interesting. Dollop is a stupid word. It's also a stupid contronym. It's like a lot of a thing, a little of a thing. There's no poetry there. So not every contronym is going to become a work. There's like 80 of these in English. I would say maybe 50 total have a kind of poetry and a relationship to the body that makes it worthwhile to go through that process. And then, of course, what falls beneath from that erasing <clears throat> is little bits of the pink pearl eraser, little bits of the paper, and also some of that definition written onto the surface of the page. And so by the end of the piece, once I've spit across the whole thing and erased the whole thing, I'll scoop up what's underneath, and that becomes its own small sculptural work. So this is Bound from 1968. Bound is a contronym. It exists as a diptych on paper. It also exists in this erased uh, residue form. And the same for find, 1982. In this instance, because I was looking at those um, violent illustrative sentences within find, I used a black magic eraser. Something about that felt a little bit more charged and funereal and mournful. And a little pink pearl kind of got in there from somewhere too. And this I did find uh, a kind of repeated erasing of find, but I spread it across the entire surface of the bottom. So this previous work, this is from find from the, the diptych, right, the contronym. For this piece, I actually erased over and over again those illustrative sentences. So there were so many of them that it, that it led to more erasure and therefore more residue. And it feels in this kind of format like a sentence, right, versus a, a moment. It feels like a the absence of an entire kind of conversation. This is a close-up. <coughs> and stumbling on find actually led me to start looking less at the definitions that are opposing in those contronyms and more at the illustrative sentences. So skin is a contronym. It's, it's kind of creepy. It's like to cover with skin or to remove the skin from. So it exists as a contronym, but also the illustrative sentences for it were super poetic and related to the body in a um, kind of surreal way. So to save one's skin by the skin of one's teeth, to lose one's skin, the skin, of, the skin off your back, those kind of illustrative sentences when taken out of context become that much more eerie, I think. Yeah. So I started to look for more illustrative sentences within those contronyms and came across and started working on these larger format works. So bound is still a contronym, but in this instance, both of these definitions, what's left legible from bound is the illustrative sentences, the ends of the earth, the end of his rope. They're poetic and illustrative, but they still have that kind of oppositionalness embedded within them. So they're printed a little bit closer together on the same large sheet of paper. And so they create, a, a, to me, a more bodily form um, and a more formal kind of minimal uh, relationship. But for this work, I love how disparate they are, right? The erasure is, the, <laughs> the erasure is as far away from it, or the legible parts are as far away from each other as they could possibly be. This is temper, 1968. What's left legible is to lose one's temper or to keep one's temper. Both super possible. Fine from 1982. I like to read it uh, right to left, right starting here. So I'm fine and you. And they are as far apart as they could possibly be. They'll never be in conversation with one another, right? 
and mean from 1982. This one feels relevant. The Statue of Liberty signifies a haven for the oppressed. Crossing our borders represents aggression. Both of those possibilities are um, embedded in this current political moment. So this is a new work that I started when I moved to New York, or a newer work than those. So I'm originally from Alabama. And when I got to New York, there was this beautiful work about an uh, exhibition that Thomas Lacks curated at the Studio Museum. And so the Studio Museum, the exhibition space is on the, the first floor. And so there's this show about what does it mean to be a Southern artist? What does it mean to have work that emanates from the South? And then people would come through that exhibition and they'd come up to my studio and they'd know I was from Alabama. And so I kept hearing this question over and over again. Oh, how does it feel to be a Southern artist living in New York? And they would do this like shoulder shrug thing. And I don't know because I've never called myself Southern. It's not a term that I um, have ever used. And I think, that, well, I know because when you say it, I, the image that comes to mind is white and it's male. And my body doesn't fit within that identity. And so it's not a term I'm comfortable with. I think my work comes from the South. It, it comes, it's like rooted in that place. I wouldn't make the work that I make if I had not been from where I'm from. But South and Southern are like two drastically different things and they mean different things. And so I, again, similar to the white noise pieces, I didn't know how to answer that question. So I found this Southern Review, it's called the Southern Review. It's a literary journal. It's been published since the 1930s out of Louisiana State University. Writers tend to know it. I haven't met a lot of artists who know it, but for writers, it's a very prestigious journal. And so I started looking for um, issues from the 80s, because that's my decade of birth. <clears throat> and I, would, I started ripping them apart and then filling in the body of the page's text with a super rich, velvety charcoal. So titles get to stay, authors stay, page numbers, headers, footers, everything's untouched except that body. And for me, this was a way then to reimagine an answer to that question. What does it mean to be a Southern artist? How does it feel to be a Southern artist living in New York? How do I answer that question of being Southern? Um, is to rewrite the narrative of what it means to be Southern. So the first few pieces of these that I did, filling in the body of the page's text, when it ripped the page, I would throw that away. When the charcoal kind of, you know, when you're working with super extra soft charcoal, it can become a kind of soot all over your body. When it would spread across the page or my finger would kind of smudge it, I would throw those pages away. And then I realized that's the good stuff, right? My fingers across the surface of each page is a kind of a handling, a grappling with what it does, what does it mean to be Southern? Let me rewrite the story rather than trying to fit in the story that already exists. This is an issue from 1985, it's a special edition. So in 1985, the editor changed at the Southern Review. <coughs> and so the new editor creates a special edition of all African American writers. And he places in the front a kind of contributor's or editor's note. And it says, we haven't had a lot of black authors up till now, here they all are at once. Done, right? <laughs> it's like, a, ah, fixed it, done. <laughs> <clears throat> and so it's actually a beautiful addition. It's a lot of writers that I admire and that I love and that I did not want to do my own process to, right? It's like they're already rewriting what it means to be Southern. Why does it need my hand? And so this piece for me still makes me uncomfortable because I like a system. I like to come up with a system and I follow those rules and make that work. And I know that it will lead to a kind of transcendent place if I just keep repeating it long enough. Um, that it either becomes painful or meaningful or both. But for this work, it was like I would get to an author that I recognized and it was like I, didn't, I just didn't want to touch it. It didn't need my intervention. And so there's a lot more text that's left legible because of that constant trying to negotiate um, the rules versus my emotional response to that piece. <laughs> That breaking the rules has not happened since. I keep wondering if it's going to come back into the practice, but not yet. And that piece probably makes me the most uncomfortable still. It's like so super formal and minimal. It shouldn't be that tension provoking, but it is. And these are just some up close pieces. So you can see some detail. Every once in a while, an image will pop up 
I love those pages. Um, there's something about the expectation that behind the black box would be the image, but that the image exists makes you kind of question the relationship between the two. There's also an expectation that um, Southern artists, the ones that we tend to know, work in a kind of folk outsider way or a photographic way, at least the ones we've known previously when I was studying art history. And so it's, it's like the representational landscape kind of photograph that it then also subverts that expectation is really satisfying to me. And I love the tears. This is a pattern of practice. So up until now, I've been working with dictionaries from the 50s and the 80s. The Southern reviews have always been from the 80s. This is the first time I've used a, a kind of, I mean, it's a historical document, but it's a current document. And that also made me really uncomfortable because there's no historical distance from the Ferguson report, which is what I'm printing here. I think that was published in 2015. 2015, I think. Um, that I remember the summer waiting for the Ferguson report to come out. So this was after the shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. There was a kind of expectation about would that DOJ, DOJ document tell the truth about that moment. And my expectation was that it would not, but there was a kind of anticipation for that report. And so I knew I wanted to make some work around it, especially after I heard or I read this professor give an interview and say that reading this report was like being told that water was wet. It's like, of course it is. But if you haven't been saying water is wet for so, water is wet for so long, like the truth of the matter can be extremely gratifying. So the Ferguson report then kind of details the police misconduct, um, what's wrong in Ferguson from the municipality all the way to the police. Um, and then it also touches on Michael Brown's death, but it's kind of an overarching look of everything that led up to Michael Brown's death. It's a beautiful document. It's like, here are all the reasons which led to this tragedy. That's a tantalizing prospect, right? If you could pinpoint any one moment in your life and be given all the reasons for its occurrence, that's a kind of beautiful explanation. It feels impossible, and yet here it is in one document. It's a truth-telling document. It's also a painful document. So I chose to blind emboss this work. So I printed the, uh, the text of all 91 pages of the report. So the, the report's actually longer. I excluded the conclusion pages. So the 91 pages excluding the conclusion pages, which is kind of like, how do you fix this thing? Pages. And blind embossing then forces the text to protrude from the surface of the paper. It so almost becomes like a braille, except it's still in its English. It's still legible for me. Um, from a distance, it looks like a wall of white up close. That text is actually still legible. It's hard on the eyes, though. It's also shown unframed intentionally. My gallery would love to frame this work because it's just white paper exposed for the world. Somebody is bound to mess it up eventually. Um, <clears throat> but I want you to want to touch it. I want that to be a possibility for you. And I want you to also be rejected from it, right? To feel like it is impossible for you to touch it at the same time. Back to that Ta-Nehisi Coates um, quote about trying to learn the language, like struggling with the language, making that language physical, being in the place makes you understand the place. I want you to want to understand this moment and not be able to because it is, um, you are distanced from it. It's not the word I want, but you're propelled from it. Yeah. These are a couple other pages. So in 1968, the Kerner Commission report actually came out, which was um, a response to the civil unrest of the 60s, 67, 68 in particular, riots that are happening. It's actually a very similar document, right? It's, it's supposed to be all the reasons for what happened in the 60s, for what led to the 60s, or the civil unrest in the 60s. What's interesting is those conclusion pages are strikingly similar to the conclusion pages of Ferguson report. We have known for at least four decades what we should do. 
So I left those pages out because that feels like the repeated moment. Like we know the answer. Let's focus on the problem. That seems to be what we keep doing with all of these DOJ reports. And none of the answers were actually followed. <laughs> so this book is the Birmingham News from 1963. It's a similar blind embossing, except here I'm embossing the paper twice. So every paper, piece of paper goes through the, uh, the press twice. And this paper is much thinner. It's much more fragile. And so it doesn't hold up as well as that Ferguson report, a pattern of practice Somerset paper. So in 1963, the Birmingham News Editorial Board decided not to publish any civil rights stories on their cover pages. <clears throat> so you had hundreds of children being arrested during the spring campaign. The Washington Post, the LA Times, the New York Times, even the Montgomery Advertiser, I think, was publishing those iconic images, those photographs of the fire hoses and the police dogs and the marchers being arrested. The Birmingham News, where these protests are actually happening, they post stories about Sophia Loren is sick in bed and can't make her movie shoot. And they sent a reporter to the, the zoo, and he pet a snake. And they have a very large picture of the reporter petting the snake, and the snake is like wrapped around the reporter. So this is front page news at the time when everybody else is covering a kind of different narrative. So what I decided to do here was actually go to the Birmingham Library and search through their old microfilm, microfiche, and find these cover pages, particularly from the spring campaign. So I limited it to this moment when there's an incredible um, escalation of violence against these protesters happening. And I looked for those moments then that weren't covered. So what you actually see on the front pages of these, it's a bunch of other stories, right? In this instance, different than a pattern or practice with the Ferguson report, the blind embossing acts in a different way. With a pattern or practice, it's all the information, the impossibility of knowing everything. With the Birmingham News, it's none of the information, right? The blind embossing points to a kind of absence versus a totality. I made this piece right after the 2016 election, and it felt like we were kind of cycling back to the 60s and that unrest of the 60s. And so the falling of the part of the paper to me feels like if you do a thing twice, does it hold up under that amount of pressure? If you cycle back to it, um, is the institution of the paper, right, the newspaper, strong enough to hold up? And in these instances, it wasn't. It's another detail of a front page. And then I think you can see the text a little bit better up close and some of those tears in the surface too. When they did report on these stories, they would bury them inside if they reported on them. And then even then they wouldn't interview anyone involved. And so it would be this very kind of stenographic reporting, facts and figures, but no voices. I think I'm gonna skip these. Let's talk about that. <coughs> this is America a Hymnal. It's an art, a small edition artist book that I made last year. So from the 18th to 20th centuries, there were 100 different versions of My Country Tis of Thee written. This was kind of a common practice, less so today. Um, but because people tended to know that tune, uh, lyricists, composers knew that they could attach that tune to new words and you would already know the music so it would be very familiar to you. It was a way of kind of uh, linking us all together so that we could sing a different music knowing the same uh, musical notes. So suffragettes had their version of My Country Tis of Thee. Uh, the temperance movement had a lot of versions of My Country Tis of Thee and they're bad. They're all like drink my water, your kids are not gonna make it. They're very depressing. You know, it's like, don't drink alcohol, drink some water, have a cup, that kind of thing. They're not that great. A lot of temperance versions. And then there are some beautiful uh, labor versions, some kind of individual state identity kind of versions. The Confederacy had their own version. Abolitionists had multiple versions as well. So a lot of times these songs would actually be in opposition to each other. This idea of like what it means to be American is often in opposition. I made this after the election, too, as a way of, I mean, I think you know why. Um, <clears throat> oh, but the inside, all 100 versions are printed, and the lyrics remain legible, 
I burned away the music on every single page. So the music, the thing that's holding them all together in similarity, is gone. You only see it in its kind of uh, the edge of the burn, right? The notes are actually missing. All the differences remain. So it's a hundred different versions of what it means to be American. This is rights of woman. This was a good one, too. Some of them are better than others. The last one is actually Marian Anderson singing from the Lincoln Memorial, I think in 1939. And she only changes one word, uh, which is I to we. So not every version is actually a kind of entirely new thematic song. Sometimes they were just simple, different, simple shifts. And then these works are actually, or two of these works are in the show. This is Total Eclipse. So a lot of this new work actually comes from this political moment and trying to grapple with this moment, including these pieces. So total eclipse, well, let me start this way. I started searching for texts that talked about loss in a hundred different ways. Total eclipse is an Annie Dillard essay where there's a total eclipse moment and she loses the sun and she feels like she loses the ground beneath her. Love and Leaving is from a Rachel Cusk essay, where she, is that right? She becomes a mother, um, and she feels like she loses her body and her sense of individuality, and she doesn't, her sense of like self in the world is gone. Octavia Butler's Speech Sounds is a, um, it's a short story called Speech Sounds. Octavia Butler is a black sci-fi writer, and there she's talking, she actually creates this world in which there's a, it's a sci-fi. There's a virus that takes out our ability to speak to one another, and so we have to learn other ways of communicating. And of course, the world devolves into an apocalypse. Um, and the, well, I won't tell you the ending, but you should read it. You could like Google it and find it. You don't have to buy it. It's a really good short story. So we lose the ability to, to link up to one another, to feel like there's things that we can communicate together. And then there's James Baldwin, where he feels he moves to France for a few years, and he feels like he loses his country. I was looking for ways that people were giving language to a sense of loss, not a specific loss, different ones. Um, but I, I needed the words to talk about what happens when you feel like you lose your country, what happens when you feel like you lose what you thought you understood. It's a very earth-shaking kind of moment. It's also a very familiar kind of moment. And that's the tension that I wanted to exist in these works. So say, similar to the contronym pieces then, I'm rewriting the text from all of these different sources. And in this instance, I'm leaving only legible what feels like the language that I needed, that I was looking for, and the language that I can use. So from James Baldwin, I don't know if I can read it. As futile as it is inevitable, the pulpit, the church, and home, deliberate repudiation of everything, no. <laughs> from uh, Annie Diller's Total Eclipse, it's obliterated meaning itself, for what is significance? No people, no significance. Name the substrate, the ocean, or matrix, or ether, the unified field, our complex and explicable caring. And speech sounds, let's see. Stand by and wait, is that what that says? Stand by and wait? Push things that far. Both hands empty. I can't read that. You have to go and see the exhibition to see the last part. I don't know what that says. <laughs> and this is actually uh, one that's not in the show. It's from Jimmy Carter's concession speech. Mm. I think that part of it says, I have not lost either love. And then there's like parentheses, laughter. That's a sad. And then these are the final works I'll show you. Um, and then I'm happy to take some questions. So I have a show up in Chicago. The title of it is Undersong. I was interested in finding a way to bring back that process from the white noise pieces, the chalkboard early works, but to make them feel new again and to say something entirely different.
So in 1988, Edie Hirsch published a book called Cultural Literacy, Things Every American Should Know. In the back of it, then, first he makes this argument that there are things we should share in order to feel like we belong together this, in this disparate place. And in the back, he creates an index of 1,000 things that we all have to know to feel like we have a shared national identity. There are nine patriotic songs listed. Uh, and so I made a, I'm making a painting for each song. This red of the panel is relevant. It relates to the uh, America the Hymnal, that red of the outside cover. So it starts this red, and then the next few pieces go further and further. It's like that red in shadow more and more and more until eventually they'll become this deep, rich, purple kind of black space. But similar to the white noise in here, I'm selecting language from these patriotic songs that feels like it's love language. It could be like a pop song, kind of lovey-dovey kind of language, which feels oppositional to how I think about a kind of nationalistic patriotism. So in this case, it's Thy Name I Love, and the source is My Country Tis of Thee. And I'm rewriting it over and over again to feel like I finally understand what that means. Thy Name I Love, I Am For You, from Grand Old Flag. I don't like that song. Do I don't. It's not a good song. And so I'll make nine of those paintings, a different red for everyone. Um, some of them in Edie Hirsch's list, and they're not that great. Have you ever heard Over There? I'll sing it to you. It goes over there, over there, over there. It's a dumb song. Um, <laughs> and so I'm not going to use all of his list, but I will make nine, and I'll kind of supplement some other patriotic songs that I used to sing in school. I just read an NPR story that kids don't know My Country Tis of Thee anymore. They're not singing it. I don't know if you did. Did you used to sing it in school in the morning? Yeah, we would like sing patriotic songs. That way we all know them. Not anymore. Um, which is interesting. Good or bad, that's interesting. Um, these are new Odyssey works. These are also from my new show. So they have a similar process to the lost pieces in this show, in the eye of the beholder. Um, except they're always diptychs, so kind of like the continents, they're now in conversation together. So Emily Wilson uh, published a translation of the Odyssey last year. She's the first woman to translate the Odyssey into English. Has anybody read this? It's really good. I think the, I'm sure the Odyssey was assigned in high school, and I never read it. I am reading this version. There's a kind of swiftness to her language. It doesn't feel uh, laborious, like a super long text. Um, but what's interesting is, in all the interviews she's given, she points out this one snippet, which is that the 60 men who have translated the Odyssey prior to her have all translated the first line differently. The first line is about when we're trying to understand who, who is this man who, that we're about to like read about his journey, who is Odysseus? And there have been 60 different adjectives given to describe Odysseus, but these are all coming from the same Greek, right? one Greek term, 60 different English terms. And so far, they've been positive. He's adventurous. He's a hero. He's cunning. He's crafty. They've been negative. He's mischievous. He's, I don't know, the other negative ones. Um, but 60 different ways. So Emily Wilson finally translates it this way. He was a complicated man. Yeah, he was a complicated man. That one term then embodies all the positive and negative which has come before it. It's a really interesting choice. So I started to look through these old translations of the Odyssey and start to compare them, similar to the contronyms. In book 13, there's this moment when Odysseus finally reaches his homeland after 20 years searching for it, and he doesn't recognize the place. And so this is the moment, these are the first few questions that he asks, looking out at his own shoreline. One translation says, what land is this, what people, what men are born here? Or, what country, what land is this, who are the people that dwell in it? Those are two very different questions. What are the men, what men are born here, what people dwell here? Sorry two very different ways of asking the same original Greek question. And so that idea of like, similar to the, my interest in the, um, 
the contronyms and the dictionaries, this idea that it should be an unbiased representation of language, and it's actually full of opinion um, and difference and representational of who we are in the world. I think I'll stop there. I think I'm out of time, so maybe I'll just take some quick. And I'm not out of time. Let's talk about this. Just, just that one. This one. So, these are embossings as well. Um, these are, so I pulled um, hmm, classified ads published by people who were looking for family after emancipation. So after, it's right at the end of the Civil War, all the way up until 1920, people would post ads in uh, black, six black newspapers across the South, mostly across the South, um, looking for their family members. And they would include all the information that they could remember, it's usually not that much, who they belonged to, where they're living now. Um, and then they would give these kind of, they would start to emerge a way of asking for your people. In this case, it's do you know them? Each ad would begin with do you know them? Do you know them? Do you know them? And then they would give the information they could remember. Or in this instance, the phrase was can you help me to find my people? And that phrase started to show up in 1890s. Um, for one reason or another, people started to repeat the same phrase in these ads. The other kind of turns of phrase are, I wish to find my people. I am anxious to find my people. I want to find my people. I would like to find my people. It's like 10 different ways of asking for your family. But because they're, you know, they're each individual, right? They're giving you the individual details of the person they can remember but they become a kind of chorus of longing, I think, all together in that repetition of the, the question, what became of my people? So I'll stop there. Any questions? I'll take a class. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did I answer every, I, told, I said everything. <laughs> Yeah. I said everything. Can I answer anything for you? Okay, I'll start questions. Okay. Because I said I was going to ask you this. I was thinking today when we were, because I told you we were we went over some of this in my class this morning. Mm -hmm. And I was like, for a minute, I was like, you know what? This is, there's some power happening here, like shift, shifts of power. But almost like magic too, because language is like powerful. Mm -hmm. And do you ever feel like you're in this like zone, like when you're creating, like what is it, what is it like to go through? Because I think for me, when I was thinking about even the erasing, like the erasing process, mm -hmm. like what does it do? Like yeah. where are you at after you've gone and written for so many, like it's been yeah. printed and then you Mm -hmm. Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. You guys know Elizabeth Gilbert? Who's like, yeah. I don't usually mention Elizabeth Gilbert, but um, <laughs> she said something in an interview. I think it was on On Being, which is this podcast about kind of like spirituality, open ended spirituality. She said she grew up on a farm, and writing is a lot like farming. Most of it is just boring labor. You have to know how to be bored, and you have to know how to labor. Every once in a while, there's a little bit of like fairy dust. That's the good moment. Most of the day is the, the burrowing in. To me, that feels like my practice. Viha Kelmans is another example of this. If you've ever watched her Art 21 video, she looks like she is the most unhappy artist I've ever met, and I love her. I love her. The first line, she said, like, you know, you, you zoom into her studio, they turn the corner, and she's like silently painting, slowly painting. And then she says, I hate this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <clears throat> um, so the white noise pieces, I used to have a rule for myself that I could write that thing forever. How I know that it's finished is that my hand hurts. I cannot, it's like cramping, I can't write it anymore. The spit pieces, they take a lot of, it's a, a different kind of labor, but they take a lot of like body, right? The um, embossings, 
I am not a printmaker, and so when I was first doing them, it's going to make any printmakers in the room super uncomfortable. I did, I don't know what was I was doing wrong, but I had to like physically push the bed through and under the, yeah, I, I think I messed up somebody's drum actually. But that sense of like, it only matters, I know it matters when it's become painful. I know it matters when I've done it a hundred times. And there is a physical knowing in my body that I recognize as a kind of labored pain. I mean, that's probably personality. That's probably like, who knows why. But there is a, I mean, I'll tell you this. I grew up in Alabama. So I grew up in, it's like by necessity, I grew up in the church, in a Presbyterian church. We used to have these 48-hour Bible readings. Did you ever do this? Just me. <laughs> um, and so you would sign up for your hour, and you would go and read your hour of text all through the night. Right? And everybody would sign up for their hour. And if you were on the emergency list and somebody couldn't show up, you got the call at 3 a.m. and you would have to come and read for your hour. Sometimes people would be in the pews. A lot of like Old Testament, the pews would be empty. Um, but a lot of that text is super boring. And so it wasn't, the important part of it wasn't so much that um, people were listening. It was that it was being done. Right? The important part to me and a lot of this work is my own kind of edification, it's much less about the viewer. It's I know that it's valuable because I have processed it. I have labored it. And then it deserves to be in the world. That's usually what it's like. I'm like a Vihak Kelmans. Hate it. And then it's good. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. No, I can remember every problematic statement that's ever been said to me. And sometimes I play them over and over again. I have a, it's just an obsessive uh, personality. No, and I think that shows up in the work. That sense of like residue of language will never be gone. There is no way to completely rid yourself of the residue of that. So on the chalkboard surface, some of that, that text is so legible in the background. The erasure sculptures, like they retain the same title as the thing that was erased because it is the same thing in new form, but the essence is still there. In the burn laser cut book, the hymnal still smells like burn. It's kind of acrid sometimes. The notes sometimes still fall when you turn the pages. That piece is still like self-destructing the more it's read. Language is never gone. <laughs> I think my personal outlook is closer to like the contronyms. You just learn to abide. Maybe. And then other days you're like Vihak Helmas and you're like, I hate it. <laughs> Love her. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. A lot of your work seems to involve a lot of the written language. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered doing something about the spoken language or the unspoken, such as with the uh, hands or so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to wrap my brain around that. So I have a performance coming up in December where it's going to be a day-long singing of the hymnal. I'm not going to do it, but other people are going to do it. So it'll kind of be like that. It'll be related to that Bible reading, kind of durational endurance kind of reading that's from my childhood. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like. I have a hard time imagining the word aloud versus the word written. The written makes more sense to me. Maybe it's just because you have like a longer time to grapple with it. This is, this is off the cuff and makes me a little more uncomfortable. So I'm going to try it and we'll see how it goes. And then there'll probably be some sort of uh, audio recording of it that could become another thing. I don't know how that looks yet. Good. Done. Thank you so much. <laughs>
hopefully you'll stick around for a little bit with us. We're gonna have some sweet treats and a little bit of nausea. And if you, there were burning questions that you just didn't wanna ask, cause like sometimes it's hard to ask questions in public, then he's gonna be here. We're gonna take the mic off.